this first story is uh, from when I was in my mid twenties, and I got the reputation of uh, being known as one of Pittsburgh's clean comedians uh, because uh, I do I, I was doing a lot of like stories about my family, and uh, I wasn't really doing like overtly sexual material. Uh, or or challenging the authority or anything, so I was like very marketable, is is kind of the way that you would put it. And basically, like if you don't know what clean comedy is, uh, it's basically like you don't curse, you don't do any of that sort of stuff. You're very bookable at this point, uh, and most importantly, you're not challenging anybody's belief system. Or <laughs> <authority>. <laughs> very important. <laughs> Uh, so in my early twenties, I was kind of try, I was kind of doing that because I like I wanted to I wanted to get booked by by people. So because of that, I caught the ire of a lot of like wealthy Indian people uh, because me being Indian myself, uh, wealthy Indian people would like book me uh, to come do private events at their house. Uh, and mostly, what this would involve is doing like adult birthday parties. Now these are birthday parties with adults that's that's what that is it's birthday parties with adults it's not like a a, a birthday party where everybody kind of just shows everybody their dildo collection like that's not uh what <laughs> what what this uh what this event was it's just birthday parties for like older people you know like an adult birthday party i think you guys get it you guys understand what i'm saying this is this is not a dildo party uh when i say adult birthday party <laughs> So most of these things I would get booked to do, I would, um, I would show up and I would do my standup in, in somebody's living room or, or a basement. Uh, and without fail, uh, I would drunkenly get yelled at by uh, the, the birthday boy or girl or whoever it was. Uh, or I, I would be told that I'm doing a disservice to the entire Indian population by my sheer existence. Uh, and then somebody would give me money and I would go and swallow my pride. That's mostly what would happen <laughs> at these sort of events. Uh, now, one of these parties that I got uh, uh, booked to do was uh, a birthday party on the same night that I did a, a black box theater. I headlined, a, uh, I was gonna headline the black box theater, which was kind of a big deal because this was the very first time in my entire career uh, that I was going to be billed as a headliner. So like I was not going to give that up. Right. So I decided that I was going to do the birthday party and the black box theater show at the same time. Right. I would perform at the birthday party around seven 30. That's what they, that's what I was told. And then I would do 30 minutes. I would get my money and then I would drive 45 minutes to the other side of town and perform at this uh, black box theater, which was going to be uh, far less lucrative. Uh, but much, much, much more fun, right? So I was kind of excited about that. And sometimes as a working comic, right? Like you're, you're kind of struggling. Yeah, you gotta do, you gotta do certain things for money. Uh, and sometimes uh, those certain things involved uh, having 50 something year old Indian people uh, yell at you drunkenly. You know, that's just, <laughs> that's just what you gotta do, you know? <laughs> And here's the thing is, these people, like, I knew that I had undersold myself when I was negotiating the price, and they didn't argue with me at all. Like, they were just like, that's fine. And I was just like, oh, man, I think I undersold myself. And then I confirmed those suspicions uh, when I pulled up to the house, because this house was massive. It had gates, and then it had multiple fountains multiple fountains you guys and here i am being a sap and i charged them like single fountain money <laughs> it's like what an idiot i was <laughs> so i walk up i walk up to the front door i ring the doorbell and this uh this indian woman opens uh the the door and she's wearing like this very elaborate beautiful sari and she looks at me and she goes who are you okay uh, well, I'm, uh, I'm the comedian that was, uh, that was hired uh, to uh, perform. Then she goes, oh, that's you. I said, yeah, it's, it's, that's me. Uh, can I come in? She goes, oh, no, you can't come in here. What you have to do is go around 
uh, around the back, down the steps, and into the basement. That's where you go. You're not allowed on the first floor. I was like, cool, this, this is a good start. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so I walk around this house, and I'm walking down these steps, and immediately, like, all the conspiracy theory alarms are going off in my head, right? Like, this is, this is like the start to every fucking eyes wide shut movie that you ever see you know where like the average working class kid shows up to the rich person's house and then gets trapped in like some blood orgy cabal situation and i have to like crawl through the vents to get out you know like i don't want to i don't want to deal with any of that <laughs> just wanted to tell some jokes <laughs> you know so i uh i get downstairs and i immediately see like the most gregarious Indian man that I've ever met in my entire life, right? Like he's super excited to see me. He's super excited uh, to like have me at this at this place. Uh, and he, he like he does he does one of those handshake hugs, you know, like where he goes in for the handshake, but then he pulls you in and you're gonna get a hug. Like you guys are old Roman warriors, right? Like, <laughs> like it's just gonna happen whether you want it or not, you know. Like that's sort of <laughs> the situation. And then he starts telling me about the event where he was, where I was going to perform for not one, but two birthday boys who were going to be turning 60 on the exact same date. They were two old Indian men that had been friends for like 40 years and they had their birthday on the exact same day. Is that like not the most adorable thing you've ever heard? <laughs> of? Right? <laughs> Like, that should be like a sitcom on CBS, you know? Like, <laughs> but it will never be because uh, CBS only likes to pretend that it's progressive. <laughs> it's not actually. They just like to portray stereotypes and still think that Indian people are scared of girls. <laughs> but anyway, so he starts telling me, uh, you know, details about uh, what the, what the uh, event is. And, uh, and so we start talking and... He looks at me and says, um, oh, hold on. I lost the, hold on. I screwed it's it up. <laughs> so he's, ta he's talking to me, right? I got to, I got to share the screen. Uh, so here's the guy, right? And he comes over to me and he's like, hey, has anyone explained the program to you? And I'm like, oh, a what program? I was a lot younger back then because you can see that I don't have a beard yet. That's very important. Right? I had no idea about what this program was. Uh, and he goes, yeah, you're going to be like the big closing act to our program, a headliner, if you will. You're going to be headlining this birthday party. Uh, so we're probably going to start like around 645. And then some of the grandkids are going to be doing like a dance or like a poetry. And then, oh, you'll love this. This is going to be very, you're, you're going to be very excited about this. We have a couple members of our old friends group that are going to be doing like a skit. You're going to love it. It's going to be great. And I was like, oh, okay. And then like after the skit, like I'm going to go up. And he was like, yeah, yeah. And then we'd love it if you roasted the birthday boys. I was like, what? You, you, you want me to roast a bunch of people that I've never met before in my entire life i don't know if that's a good idea i was like oh no that's okay you can like talk to their kids you know get to know the birthday boys a little bit that that should that should help you get some material for the show right and i was just like this is not a good idea like this is a nightmare situation i'm walking into because if you don't know this a roast and this is very important a roast is what happens uh, when it's like an endearing thing, right? Like you, you only roast the people that you love. You have to have like a good relationship with the person or else it's just like, you're just going in there and being a dick to people. Like that's not what a roast is. That's just you being a dick, right? So the fine line is like, you know, these people, you're going to make some jabs that aren't personal or like psychologically destructive to that human being, you know, like a, it's like a fun thing, but you have to know the people. And I looked at the clock and it's 6 p.m. I have 45 minutes before this program starts to come up with just any kind of material about these people. So I walk up and I start talking to these, these uh, uh, birthday boys kids, right? And they tell me everything about their dads. 
Okay, and it's it's basically the story is that they both came from India, very humble beginnings, you know, struggled to to get to the states, and once they got to the states, you know, they uh, they fought through uh, a lot of like xenophobia and racism, and they made it to the top of their um, of their, uh, their 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 fields, uh, and they were killing it, and then they became super wealthy uh, in their profession. Uh, and they became so wealthy that they both own mansions with multiple fountains, you guys. <laughs> and I'm supposed to make fun of these people. <laughs> and it is very quickly, very quickly I'm realizing I am fucked. Super fucked. Like, there's no way I'm getting out of this thing alive. Like, this is a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm sitting there panicking and I'm looking at the clock and it's now 6.45. Nothing's happening. Okay, now it's seven o'clock. Nothing's happening. It's now 7.15. Nothing's happening. At 7.20, the program begins. 20 minutes, or not even, it's like 35 minutes later than when it was actually supposed to. So I'm sitting there, I'm trying to think of like, what am I going to say about these people? And you know, there's a bunch of like adorable shit going on in front of me right like there's like kids reading poetry and doing like dances and saying heartwarming things about their grandfathers and stuff like it's very adorable and then we finally get to the skit and what this skit is uh is a bunch of 50 something year old indian dudes talking about their boners for just entirely way too long <laughs> Wow. <laughs> like, like for like 12 minutes. <laughs> it just like wouldn't stop. Like every joke. I was like kind of impressed with how many boner jokes <laughs> these 50 year old Indian men had. <laughs> like I was like, I was, I was like, this is creative. <laughs> like you guys are really taking a deep dive. I, I did, I did think that though, after this experience, I did think that we should put a rule in place that you shouldn't talk about your boners longer than your boners actually last. I think that should be, I feel like that's a good rule to implement going forward. <laughs> so finally, they, they, you know, I waited for their money shot, uh, so to speak. Oh. Uh, I know, I'm, I, I know. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was so disappointed. I'm not a clean comedian anymore, you guys. I'm not. <laughs> so, so they wrapped it up, and I was like, all right, you know, it's my time uh, to go up and, uh, and get ready for this, get ready for whatever the fuck this is going to be. And, uh, <laughs> and then, and then the, the, the gentleman that booked me, and he goes, uh, he goes, all right, everybody, it's time to cut the cake. What? Cut the cake. And then me? That's not, I can't follow cake. That's crazy. Like, <laughs> nobody follows cake at a birthday party. Like, cake is the headliner of the birthday party. Like, once the cake is out, that's it. That's the crescendo of the show. That's it. Like, everything else after that is bullshit. Like, it doesn't matter, right? It's like, oh, we're going to cut the cake and then watch the movie. It's like, no one gives a shit about the movie. Like, we're here for the cake, right? I don't, look. My self-esteem is not as low as it was in my early 20s. Like, it's way better. But I'm still, like, not better than cake good. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to go up and be, like, I'm not, I'm maybe like a muffin. Like, if, you, if it's, like, I'm following a muffin, I'm good. You know, like a cupcake, I got it. Cookie cake, it gets a little dicey, but I think I can manage. <laughs> And then, I, and then I found out it was an ice cream cake, and I was like, I should just leave. What the fuck am I even doing here? <laughs> <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> right? So I'm looking at the clock, and it's, it's like closing. It's a little after 8. Like, it's like 8.10 or something like that. And I'm, I'm not going to make this second show. You know? So I'm texting the showrunner of the second show and letting him know what's going on. And he was like, look, we could probably hold the show to like 8.30 because people are kind of running late. They're not all here yet. So we'll hold the show. So it bought me a little bit of time and I was like, great, all right. But like nobody is going back to their seat, 
right? Because Kate's the fucking headliner. They didn't expect anything. <laughs> They're uh, like, this is it. The party's over. You know, like you don't go to see the Rolling Stones and then they play and then like your favorite local band comes in to lick a couple tunes after that. Like that's not, that's not how it works. <laughs> you know? So then uh, we go back to our old, our old pal, the, the Indian gentleman that booked me to come perform at this show. And he pulls everybody over and he goes, all right, everybody gather around, gather around. It's, it's the main event time for the evening. And it's something that I think we're all going to enjoy. This young man is going to make us laugh. And it's like we have our own Russell Peters in the house. Now, listen, oh, I am, uh, I've had this happen a couple different times in my career where people have compared me to Russell Peters. If you don't know who Russell Peters is, uh, I get compared to Russell Peters and Aziz Ansari, two incredibly famous <laughs> Indian comedians that don't sound anything like me. And I don't hate Russell Peters. I have a thing against Aziz Ansari because he ruined my life, but I don't hate Russell Peters. <laughs> I have a thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Russell, Russell Peters is like the reason why I got into comedy. I was like, oh, Indian people are allowed to do this. This seems cool. This seems nice. <laughs> right? And he's Canadian. So that's like a bonus. Right? But most of the time, there's like, it's like half and half. Like half the Indian people that'll come to see me expect me to be Russell Peters. The other half are open to whatever. And the half that always end up thinking that I'm like Russell Peters are always disappointed they're always disappointed, Aww. right? And I was just like, no, this is a bad, I don't tell them that I'm Russell Peters, this is crazy. <laughs> and then he looks at me and he goes, come on over young man, because he had clearly forgotten my name. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Fucking remember it. And I walk up to like the stage area. And as I walk up, he hands me the check in what? front of everybody. Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> Which is like not how I expected this thing to start, right? Like everything had gotten terrible so far. It was just like the show's gonna be fine. I'll go up. 30 minutes is not that hard. And then he hands me this check and I was just like, what the fuck am I supposed to? Like he didn't even do it in that slick way where he pretends to give you a handshake and then slips you the money. Like he just <laughs> straight up handed me the check. <laughs> so I had to like fold the check and put it into my pocket and then start the performance. And I, so, and so I did, right. I, I, I started the performance and I uh, did the roast as I was asked to do, which by the way, I totally didn't have to, right? Like I, could have totally just been like, I'm not doing that and just did my act. Like I had that option, but in your early twenties, that thought didn't come into my head. I was just like, I just want to be booked back again. Maybe, maybe he has more rich friends that want to cover my rent. <laughs> <laughs> That's really all I cared about at that time. So I started doing a couple of these roast jokes and it went exactly as I thought it was going to. It was awkward. It was uncomfortable. Everybody was like, why is this stranger being so mean to our family and friends <laughs> on their birthday? This is crazy. <laughs> and I don't know if this actually happened or not, but I feel like it did. I feel like I heard somebody say, boy, I, I would really kill for some boner jokes right now. Like I thought, <laughs> maybe somebody said that. And so immediately I was just like, I gotta get out of this situation. So I just turned to the, to the birthday boys and I was like, hey, I heard that you guys are, like you guys know each other, how'd you guys meet? And the first guy goes, well, I met, we met in college. And I was like, oh, we're, we're, what, uh, what, what college did you guys go to? And he was like, oh, well, it wasn't, it was like our doctorate, right? Like we, were, we both got our doctorate together. I was like, oh, that's really cool. What do you guys have your doctorate? And the first guy was like, well, I'm a diagnostician. So uh, I'm, like an, I'm like a doctor. Uh, and I was like, that's neat. And I was like, what's, uh, what's your, what's your thing? Uh, and the second guy goes, well, I have a PhD in engineering. And I looked at him and was like, oh, so you're not really a doctor, right? That kind of got some laughs. And I finally like felt calm because like somebody laughed at something I said. And in that moment of feeling calm, 
I let my guard down, and the second guy that I had just mildly insulted jumps up and grabs the microphone out of my hand and then spends the next five minutes defending his PhD <laughs> and his thesis. <laughs> The whole room was like, I guess we got to let him do it. It's his birthday, you know? <laughs> like, what else are we going to do? So after that happened, I was like, great. This is like the perfect thing to transition me uh, back into doing stand-up. So I told a couple stories. It did not go great. Most of the people in the room were still confused about what I was actually doing there. <laughs> And they were just like, this guy's interrupting cake. I don't understand. Uh, and then I finished my set. I said goodbye to, to the guy that booked me. And now I, like, I am way fucking late to this second gig that I'm like looking forward to. And I jump in my car and I just haul ass. Like I'm doing like 90 on the highway. I can feel my entire Nissan Altima shaking. You know, there's the distant voice of Marty McFly coming in. That's just like, <laughs> Hey, you got to slow down. <laughs> you got to slow it down a little bit. And I'm calling, like, this is like the most dangerous thing I've done touring. Uh, I like doing gigs and stuff. I'm calling the showrunner to let him know that I'm 20 minutes away from the venue. And I'm flying down the highway and he goes, Chris, we got to wrap up the show. The feature has been on stage for 30 minutes. We've stretched this show as far as we can go, I think that's it. We're going to have him close out. Uh, I, I think that's the show. And I just felt awful about myself. And I drove back to the city. I was dating this girl um, that lived in, in, you know, in the college part of town. And I went up to her and we, I was like super disappointed. And she was like, why don't you just go and talk to the like bookers? Like, why don't you call them and explain what happened? And I was like, no, they don't care. They don't give a shit. Like, they're not going to listen to me. This is just so, I'm so embarrassed about what happened, you know? And she was like, no, just like talk to them. So the next day after sleeping on it, I was like, I should, I should do what she said. I should go talk to them. And I knew that one of the showrunners went to this improv jam downtown. So I went and I caught him by the bar. And I sat down and I was like, hey man, uh, can I buy you a beer and explain what happened last weekend? And he goes, sure. So I bought him a beer. I sat down. I was like, look, dude, I am so sorry about what happened. I never double book myself unless I know I can make both these gigs. I totally screwed up. That's my fault. That's on me. I, like, whatever, like, what can I do to make it up to you? And he goes, you know, it's really big of you to come and apologize to me. Like, not a lot of people would do that. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll give you another chance. We'll, we'll get, get you back to, to headline a, um, a different date. And he looks at me and he goes, so what? what happened? Like, what exactly? <laughs> like, why weren't you able to make the show? So I just told him this whole story and he just looks at me and he laughs and he goes, so you got the punishment before the crime was actually committed. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, everybody? If you enjoyed this video, there is more stuff like this coming on this channel. So make sure you hit that subscribe button hit that bell icon to make sure you're getting updates about my videos. Make sure you hit that like button because uh, I think there's a dislike campaign happening on my channel. There's like one person that's just disliking all my shit. That's weird. Uh, but uh, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you hit the share button. Get the word out about this channel. Uh, and there are going to be more videos like this. But if you enjoy this video and you want to be a part of the live comedy experience in this virtual world that we're living in now uh, where, uh, where all the performance art is going virtual uh, for the time being you can join my zoom live stand-up comedy shows it's called the citizen revolution comedy show uh, the first one is on may 8th uh, and they will be consecutively every other week all of the dates are available on my website right now ramen noodles comedy.com that's r-a-m-a-n noodles comedy.com Go grab your tickets right now. They're only five bucks. Five bucks gets you in, um, and it's five bucks per residence, not five bucks per person. Uh, it's just to grab you a spot. Uh, so go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Grab your ticket. Come hang out with me. Uh, if you can, you can become a sustaining member over on the website. Sustaining members get free tickets 
to come see the Zoom virtual Citizen Revolution comedy show. Um, or you can make a one-time donation as well. Uh, but all of this stuff helps keep me afloat, uh, keeps me uh, being able to put food on the table uh, and cover all of my bills and expenses uh, to make sure that I'm putting out regular content. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for subscribing. Hope to see you again. Stay safe.